In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> Is it worth it? Have you asked yourself that question recently? That's the question I ask every time my wife and I are about to sit down and watch a movie. Um, I need to see some trailers. I need to see some reviews. Because if I'm going to spend two hours of my life in front of a TV screen, it better be worth it. Better be good. We ask that question, is it worth it for things as simple as a movie or for things as complex as a, a new job maybe? Is, uh, is the extra schooling I need to do, all the changes this is going to mean for life, is, is it all worth it? It's also a question that comes up when we consider what it means to follow Jesus. Because today we hear Jesus describing what life is going to look like for the community of people who follows him. It's not a list of conditions we need to meet in order for God to approve of us. He's just explaining, this is what it's going to look like as you follow me. And pretty much everything Jesus describes as blessed are things that we're used to hearing the world call cursed. Blessed are those who mourn. Who wants to be around a mourner? Blessed are the, the peacemakers. Blessed are the meek, the pure in heart, the lowly. Those who are persecuted for righteousness. And so as you, as you hear Jesus say those things, it can and lead you to ask the question, is it worth it? I mean, is Jesus really worth it? And is, uh, is the community into which he has placed us are they worth it too? Because uh, Christianity isn't just about a personal relationship with Jesus. It's also about a community into which he places us. Is it worth it? The Beatitudes, these uh, words of blessing that Jesus spoke, he spoke while he was on a mountainside and, and people who had been following him came and he began to teach them these words. And the first thing that jumped out to me, and I don't know if it did to you, but as I, as I read through these and prepared for today, first thing was just how much they rub against uh, the way the world defines success and victory and accomplishment. Not just today either, but even, even back in Jesus' time too, the marks of a successful life, even in Jesus' time, were, were things like wealth, and power, and status, and a, a great reputation, and achievements, and all these things. But everything Jesus talks about seems to highlight the exact opposite. Um, lowliness, I insignificance by worldly standards, uh, meekness, nothingness, even a, a tarnished reputation for, for following after Jesus. And so uh, everything that Jesus calls blessed are, are really qualities that the world calls cursed, aren't they? And he wants us to know the difference between the two. Uh, Jesus wants us to be able to discern between what he calls a life of blessing and what the world calls a life of blessing. But why is that so important? Why does he want us to be able to discern Later on in the gospel, according to Matthew chapter 16, we hear an account of Jesus pulling his disciples aside. And he asked them what people were saying about him. And just as there are lots of different opinions about Jesus today, there were lots of different opinions about Jesus back then too. And so the disciples said, well, Jesus, some people say that you're, you're John the Baptist or you're the prophet Elijah, or you're one of the other prophets who has come back to life, but, but nobody was calling him a king. And then Jesus asked his disciples, okay, well, what about you? Who do you say that I am? And Peter, by the power of the Holy Spirit, said, you are the Mashiach. That's how it would have sounded in Aramaic. You're the, you're the Christ. You're the anointed one. 
the son of the living God, which was a really, really bold thing to say back then, to claim that a, a person was God's anointed king. That was a bold, bold claim to make. And it must have been really exciting for those disciples to be in such close proximity to God's anointed king because kings are powerful and they're wealthy and they're successful and they receive honor for their achievements. Except for King Jesus. Right after Peter confessed Jesus to be the Messiah, he told the disciples, we're going to Jerusalem where I'm going to be enthroned as a king. But it's not the kind of king you guys expect. I'll be handed over and betrayed into the, the hands of the chief priests and teachers of the law. And then I'll be lifted up on a cross and crucified and die. And on the third day rise again. And when Peter heard Jesus say that, he realized, wait a second. That's not any way for a king to win. Who triumphs by losing? So he pulled Jesus aside, one-on-one. -on -one. Peter took him aside, and, and he rebuked Jesus and said, this will never happen to you. But then Jesus rebuked Peter, and he said, get behind me, Satan, because you don't have in mind the concerns of God. You're, you're thinking about the concerns of people. And Peter was, wasn't he? I mean, he was thinking about a king in the way that a world, the world defines success. Um, he was thinking about blessings in accordance with the patterns he saw around him and inside of him even. Patterns that sound sort of like this. Blessed are the powerful, for they destroy their enemies and anyone else who gets in their way. Blessed are the self-sufficient, for they decide for themselves the difference between good and evil and do whatever feels best for them. Blessed are the greedy, for their lives really do consist in the abundance of their possessions. And it sounds so different from what we hear the Apostle Paul write in Galatians 5 where he says the works of the sinful flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before, Paul writes, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so is it clear now why Jesus wants us to be able to discern between the life that he calls blessed and the one that the world calls blessed? It's going to mean the difference between what kind of king we expect him to be. So is Jesus worth it? Is he worth it? The Apostle John experienced firsthand what Jesus meant when he said, blessed are you when, when people insult you and exclude you and say, falsely say evil against you because of me. Uh, John, toward the end of his life, was exiled to the island of Patmos for proclaiming the word of Christ. And while he was there, he received visions from God uh, that are compiled into a book of the Bible called Revelation. In one of those visions, John saw a, a scroll that had seven seals on it. It was, it was sealed up. And there's this huge company of, of beings in this vision that John saw, and one of them said, who's worthy to open the scroll? 
and nobody was worthy. No one was stepping forward. And John actually began to weep. He was crying because he wanted to see. He knew that this was a word from God and wanted to see what was in the scroll, but nobody could open it. And then someone came over to John and said, don't weep, for the Lion of Judah has triumphed. And then John saw a figure come forward to take the scroll, but it wasn't a lion. It was a lamb. It was the Lord Jesus. And uh, he took the scroll, and all of these beings began to sing a song, and this is what it sounded like. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood, you purchased people for God from every tribe and nation and language. You know, the question, is Jesus worth it, probably is not the question that's popping into our heads most of the time. The question that we're probably more used to asking is, am I worth it? Am I worth it? Uh, am I worth a dramatic rescue from God himself? Uh, I think we could all say with the psalmist that our sin is ever before us. Am I worth it? And God answers with a resounding yes. Yes, you are are worth it. You're worth my best lamb, the best that I have, my perfect son. And with his blood, I purchased you for myself, called us out of a, a life of darkness and slavery and emptiness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves. You're worth it, God says. You're worth the best that I have. And it's amazing and it's beautiful. And God has raised Jesus from the dead and he has exalted him to his right hand. And he'll come again and he'll make everything new. And his kingdom will have no end. So rejoice and be glad. Receive everlasting life in Jesus' name. That's why the Beatitudes have such beautiful promises at the end of them. Blessed are you who mourn, for you'll be comforted. And blessed are you who are poor in spirit, for the kingdom of God is yours. And it's why we can say things like, because Jesus is somebody, I'm free to be nobody. Because Jesus won, I'm free to lose and to love and to serve without needing anything in return. Uh, because Jesus is strong, I'm free to be weak. Because Jesus is extraordinary, I'm free to be ordinary. And he's worth it. He always has been and he always will be. And we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Amen.